Hey everybody, it's Dr. Joe here, and uh, welcome you to another Wealth Wednesday on this chilly Wednesday evening here in the Washington, D.C. area. I hope you are doing well, wherever you are, and I hope that you're having a great week. I hope you had a fantastic week, in fact, and, uh, and so on. So today, uh, we're going to talk about an interesting topic, which uh, I think is timely, uh, at least for me, anyways. And, uh, and that's really understanding real estate cycles. And the issue is not just understanding them, but what does that mean? What do these cycles mean for real estate investors like you and I? So when should we buy? When should we hold? And when should we sell our properties? When do we buy? When do we hold? And when do I sell our properties relative to real estate cycles? As you know, I've been doing this for a little while and I've been through five real estate cycles. Cycles go up and down. Markets uh, don't always go up, and uh, we've had a, a good run for an off, uh, for a number of years. And uh, as the saying goes, all good things come to an end, and uh, cycles come and go. And the real estate, for the most part, tends to stay. So the issue is, uh, you know, business cycles happen, boom and bust take place. But what do they mean for you and I as investors? And I'll give you a couple of uh, the reason why I chose this topic. Is uh, is the fact that uh, I have a property here in the Washington D.C. Uh, I've owned it for about ten years, and uh, almost ten years. And so uh, I bought the house. We rehabbed the house, and uh, we had a tenant in there, and the tenant was there a voucher holder for nine and a half years. So she was there for nine and a half years, nine point five years, and she left uh, last week. Uh, she had it's a four bedroom house. And uh, when I bought the house, we renovated it, as I said. And so uh, we had, uh, it was a three, I think it was a three or two bedroom when I bought it and we upped it to four. And uh, so we, you know, we did the renovations at that time. And uh, so I, you know, after we rehabbed it, put it out for rent and I got a tenant, this tenant that was there for nine and a half years. So she was with me for nine and a half years. It was a four bedroom house. And uh, she was upgraded from her voucher from a four to a five. Uh, and so I think the, uh, you know, anyway, that was an addition to the family. And, uh, and so she was upgraded to a five bedroom house by the housing authority. So, uh, you know, so she was looking for a five bedroom house and she found a five bedroom house. And so she left at my house last week. So the question becomes for me is, OK, now what do I do? Uh, it's an opportunity to obviously I can continue holding it and uh, and just recycle the funds again. Uh, well, recycle, get another tenant and just keep rolling. Uh, I mean, this house, I, I was thinking about it. I could make it into a five bedroom. There's some creative use of space. I could be able to get a fifth bedroom and therefore get an increase in rent. So that's one option. Uh, option number two is to uh, refinance the house and pull out some equity that's already accrued over the period of time and three is to sell the house okay so these are the options that i'm facing for this house and uh and so i thought well maybe let's 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 talk about that for this week's wealth wednesday if you recall i had an event at one of my other houses uh about a month ago uh there's another house in washington dc which i've owned that house for about 20 almost about 21 22 years now and the tenant left there, that house, that's a six bedroom house. And I decided to keep that house. And so uh, the new tenant moved in there uh, last week, in fact, uh, you know, November the 1st. And everything is fine on that house. But this new one, I'm at odds as to, you know, what do I do? Do I take my money and run? Uh, there's quite a bit of equity in that house. That, in that neighborhood has really boomed, blossomed. It's a single family house, detached. And a pretty nice neighborhood across the street from a park and uh, and so on. So there's quite a bit of equity that's uh, accumulated over that period of time. So what do I do? Do I um, hold it, sell it, refinance it, and so on? So that's what we're going to talk about today, understanding cycles and uh, when to buy, hold, and sell. So hopefully that's a, that's the backdrop uh, as to what you know how we got to where we are today. So again, I'm going to talk about this, and uh, as usual, if you've got some questions, put them out in the uh, the chat box, and I'll try to get to them in the Ask Dr. Joe now, 
segment, which will be towards the end, about 20, 25 minutes from now. So uh, I think it's going to be a good topic. Anyway, so understanding the nuances of real estate cycles, almost like akin to, um, you know, learning the fact that, learning the language of uh, financial success. You know, what I mean by that is that you got to recognize patterns that govern property values and market dynamics wherever you are. You know, uh, I've been doing this long enough. No, I know that all good things come to an end. The booms don't, you know, prices don't always, don't always keep on rising. They do plateau, stabilize, go down. And uh, and therefore, really understanding how that whole works is really key, especially if you're a buy and hold investor. Um, you know, it, you know, because I hold it for a long time, um, I'm not really that bothered, to tell you the truth, uh, about the day to day, year to six months, uh, you know, ups and downs, because I'm keeping this thing for five, 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, so I buy what's more important to me is the location where these properties are. And uh, because I tend to buy in what I call appreciating markets, where historically prices tend to go up. So over the long haul, prices tend to go up. And therefore, I don't really worry too much about the day to day swings and uh, and so on. But uh, but either way, you do need to understand and use cycles uh, as, a, as almost like a compass uh, in terms of your decisions and how you decide to uh, go in one direction or not. Uh, direction and uh, especially if you like me you're into building wealth and building wealth is all about owning assets uh appreciating assets that increase in value over time and as the prices go up you know your equity goes up your loan goes down and uh hopefully you have tenants who pay you take care of your property pleasant to deal with and hopefully we'll stay a long time. So by doing all the things which I uh, I kind of prescribe, you know, uh, you should be uh, you should be a beneficiary of the cycles over the long haul. And but either way, you still have to decide when do you buy, when do you sell, and when do you hold. And that's what we're going to go into. So let's talk about uh, you know the first one, which is when do you buy, when to buy. Uh, I call it seizing opportunities. Um, you know, and the question I suppose that uh, you may ask is, how can I identify the right time to make a property investment? How can I identify the right time to make a property investment? And here's a dirty little secret: there is no right time. You just have to buy it. Uh, now is the right time, and especially if you buy it in a uh, appreciating area, because uh, five years from now, you wish you bought it today. Uh, I wish I bought. A lot of properties five years ago and uh and so on so the best time to buy if you do a buy and hold is now uh in fact the best time was five years ago in fact the best time was 20 years ago uh or whatever it was that's the best time but short of that the next best time is to buy it now and so you know if you're considering buying obviously there's certain things that you need to consider you know you gotta have some market insights uh you gotta do some research and uh, to a certain extent you gotta have some intuition uh, you know, if you know a market, you have an idea how the ebbs and flows, um, you know, how things work. And, uh, and so, you know, to a certain extent, you have to almost, I won't call it guess, but you're going to have to make a bet, uh, you know, uh, on this property or this location or this neighborhood, you're going to make a bet because you don't know what's going to happen uh, a year, five, 10 years, 15 years from now. But if you have some market insights, uh, if you do your due diligence, if you speak to people who are knowledgeable of the area, people who are knowledgeable of your market, then uh, I think you're better off. So look at things like economic indicators. What are the in economic indicators for that area, for that city, for that state, uh, for that neighborhood? Uh, are there any local development plans that are scheduled? Um, you know, are there emerging neighborhood trends? Are people moving in? Are people moving out? You know, uh, are they building things going? Uh, are they building? Uh, are there transportation or recreation or sports or, or, or something going on uh, that may impact, uh, you know, the desirability or the undesirability uh, of your area? And that will help you decide whether you want to invest there or not. So for beginners, I'm looking back now, um, I know it's kind of counterintuitive, but the best time to buy. If it's 
well, best time to buy is now, as I said before. But the really the best time to buy is really when the market's kind of shifting, uh, especially going down uh, during market downturns because there's less competition. Uh, a lot of people who you know got in during the heyday, you know, <laughs> uh, they lose their shirts, uh, and uh, competition generally dies down when markets slow, and uh, and prices tend to not increase so much now this 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 like this cycle is kind of different uh because supply is such low and therefore although demand has gone down supply has also got down so prices uh if anything have stabilized or gone up uh which is not usually the the, the situation so kind of a, a strange market right now but typically the best time to buy is when the market's soft uh luckily for us uh well, not luckily but right now the interest rates are going up uh, it's becoming a lot. It's becoming less affordable, uh, and so people are being priced out in terms of buying. So, if you have the means, if you have the financial wherewithal, and if you have the systems in place, this may be a good time to consider going in because you know there's a lot, there's, there's less competition, and uh, you know, and after a while, sellers will become a bit more reasonable. So, um, you know, that's for, um, you know, new investors, for intermediate investors, uh, people who have been around, who kind of, they see how this, this works out. So they can look for early signs of growth. If there are signs of growth in a particular area, then you want to buy now and, and see if you can ride that wave and, uh, and so on. And then if you're a seasoned investor, uh, you know, which is what I prescribe, is that you can buy, look for distressed properties, look for properties that need work, look for properties that aren't in pristine condition. And uh, and therefore, you can, you know, almost like the diamonds in the rough, and whereby you can do some what I call strategic renovations uh, to turn this uh, ugly duckling into a beautiful swan, as they say. So let's have a look. So let's do a case study. And the case study here is uh, we've got somebody, some uh, investor called Lauren. I uh, just picked up the name Lauren. And so Lauren's a beginner investor, okay? And she's ob observed a market downturn uh, due to the economic conditions in her area, okay? So she noticed that prices, there's less competition from other investors. Uh, they kind of, you know, they can't get financing or they, you know, they've got too many, they've taken on too much debt. And uh, so they're not kind of rushing into the market as, it, as they were during the heyday. So the market's kind of slow. And in her particular market, prices have gone down, at least stabilized. And uh, or maybe gone down significantly or a little bit. OK, so she's so what Lauren's done is be able to get herself um, financially ready. Uh, she's been able to get qualified for financing. Uh, she's uh, got her team together. Uh, contractors, her real estate agents, financial people. She's got that team together and she's looking to execute. She's looking to buy something now, uh, maybe buy a distressed property in an area that's scheduled or um, you know that she's heard during her uh, due diligence that is earmarked for growth and development. Okay, so she's been able to buy something in an area that's scheduled for improvement and, uh, and she's looking to buy now with the goal that over time, you know, by holding on to this thing, uh, the value is going to increase. And uh, five, 10 years from now, she's going to look back and say, my goodness, what a genius I was. Uh, so she kind of buying it at a, uh, at, at a slow time with the goal of holding on to this thing and riding out the storm to the long term. OK, so that's the case study for Lauren, smart Lauren. So let's talk about some action items that you can do uh, in terms of when to buy okay so you got to obviously do uh become very knowledgeable of your market the market that you're intending to invest in uh you can look at historical data uh economic data and uh you know look you know look into getting some local insights okay and uh, there are people out there who can uh share with you historical trends and uh, and therefore, you may be able to uh, get an idea what neighborhoods to invest in, what neighborhoods are likely to come up. Uh, you know, develop your property property evaluation skills, uh, your ability to assess properties, 
and your ability to, you know, kind of do the numbers and, uh, you know, and therefore you'll know when to move in because you're comfortable with analysis, you're comfortable with evaluations, you're comfortable with due diligence and things like that. But also uh, another action item is to get your financial house in order. Do a fin what I call a financial health check. And uh, what do I mean by that? I mean, things like uh, assess your financial readiness. How ready are you? Are you able to execute? Do you have your credit in, in place? Do you have your, what's your score like? Are you working on improving your score? Uh, are you looking to get pre-approvals from lenders? Uh, okay, are you looking into either commercial lending, um, you know, hard money lenders, residential lenders? Are you, you know, getting pre-approved by those folks? And are you financially ready? Because if you are, if you're financially strong and prepared, then typically you're in a better position to negotiate with, uh, you know, with prospective sellers. Okay. So that's when to buy. Next thing we're going to talk about is when to hold, i.e. nurturing your investments. You're, you, you know, when do you, okay, we've talked about when to buy. Next thing you want to know is, okay, do I, how, when do I hold it? How, how long should I hold it for? And what's the, some of the considerations during that time? Okay. So the question becomes, you know, how do I maintain a profitable real estate portfolio over time? Because you're holding this thing. So you're going to be developing a portfolio of other properties. Okay. So the question becomes, how do I maintain uh, this portfolio, uh, you know, while I'm uh, for, for, for this duration of time? Because if you're going to hold it, you better know what you're doing because, uh, you know, especially if you're going to get into tenants, if you don't know how to find good tenants, screen good tenants, manage the tenant relationships, you, you'll, 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 you'll drive yourself crazy and, uh, or they'll drive you crazy. I'm sorry. And, uh, and therefore you may decide to exit prematurely. Uh, there was a, a, a saying goes, uh, it's better to have, Better to sleep well than eat well. Have you heard that saying before? Better to sleep well than eat well. Uh, what that means is that it's better to have peace of mind. If you're going to have a portfolio, it's good to have a peace of mind. Sleep well, okay? Because if you don't have peace of mind, i.e. you got tenants from hell, you got tenants that are driving you crazy, it, it, it's really deep, very it's very frustrating. It's very stressful. And, uh, you know, and I've been there where tenants don't want to pay you. And, uh, you know, they know the law better than you do and so on. So better to sleep well than eat well. OK, so anyway, so that's the issue now is how do I maintain this portf portfolio for the long haul? So that, that way I can be a beneficiary uh, when I exit, when I decide to sell. OK, so uh, holding property is almost like tending to a garden. You know, it requires consistent care and attention. You've got to be caring and attentive to your portfolio you can't you know just let it run run roughshod because uh you know tenants and properties don't maintain themselves somebody has to you know take care of them and if, if you're not doing it uh you better have somebody else doing it for you because they're not going to take care of itself and so holding properties uh you know you're going to have to successful investors are going to have to focus on uh, three things okay one is making sure that you have high tenant satisfaction. you got tenants that are happy, uh, you know, uh, staying in your property. Number two is uh, you've got long-term tenants, tenants that are staying for the long haul, because as you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, what do you call it? Turnover is uh, a huge uh, cost drain. And if you don't know what you're doing and you got uh, that constant revolving door, you're thinking you're making money, but in reality, you're not. Okay. And also proactive maintenance. You know, sometimes at some point, some work needs to be done at the house, uh, repairs, maintenance stuff, either yearly, quarterly, seasonal maintenance, things happen. And uh, if you don't take care of it, and uh, you know, those small problems become big problems. So, uh, you know, so what do we do as savvy or successful investors? We're going to, you know, at least pay attention to certain things. We want our our properties to to be appealing 
uh, and to be attractive to prospective ten prospective tenants. So that way we differentiate our pro properties from others and therefore we can attract what I call tier one tenants. who are gonna take care of the property, pay, pay, pay the rent, pleasant to deal with and hopefully stay a long time. Uh, if you're an intermediate investor, you know, certain things that you may wanna consider as well. Uh, you know, I'm not a real proponent of this one, but you know, you may wanna diversify your, uh, your, por your portfolio, maybe buy in different areas, maybe buy in different asset classes. If you're not comfortable with uh, just having all your eggs in a real estate basket, uh, but there is there are some benefits to uh, diversification, and uh, you know, and then uh, you know uh, the the important thing though is to nurture your investments in such a way that uh, you know you 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 get a consistent income stream. Okay you are attracting the kind of tenant who's going to protect your investment and provide you with regular, consistent um, uh, rental income, okay, cash flow. And uh, hopefully, you know, they'll be uh, preserving and protecting your investment. And, uh, and therefore, hopefully, you'll be a beneficiary of time. So you're letting time do the heavy lifting uh, by having quality tenants uh, you know, that you're renting to. So let's do a case study. And this person we're going to call James. So James is an intermediate investor. And he's been around for a little while. And uh, we are now going through a market uh, downturn. Okay, so that's what, that's what we're facing. So what does James do during this market downturn? Well, during a market downturn, uh, you know, the economy tends to go south or down. Uh, you tend to get higher vacancy rates and uh, it's more challenging to attract tenants. Obviously, that's very location specific. Uh, but generally, during market downturns, uh, it's a lot more challenging for, uh, you know, for, for, for landlords. So what's James to do? Well, James is going to realize that, OK, he wants quality tenants he's going to take care of them. And these quality tenants have choices. He's not the only... A landlord or housing provider in town, they have competition, or he has competition. So he invests, or he's decided to invest in certain upgrades such that he can attract and appeal to these tier one tenants who are going to take care of his property. So, uh, you know, and, you know, some investors say, well, market downturn, I'm not going to do anything. Uh, I'm not going to, you know, I'm just going to do the basics, the bare minimum in order to just get by. Uh, but James is taking a different approach. He wants to appeal uh, to a certain type of tenant. So he's going to invest strategically uh, in his properties in order to attract those in uh, those investors. So he can attract quality in tenants. And therefore, since he has quality tenants, he's going to ensure a consistent income stream. And uh, quality tenants tend to safeguard his investment. OK, so that's the strategy that James is doing during uh, this market downturn that he's experiencing. So what's the action items that we can do? Uh, cash flow analysis. You're, you know, you need to know, you know, uh, how your the performance of your real estate. Okay, so you need to do uh, conduct an analysis of your property's cash flow. You got to understand the income streams. Where's the money coming from? Uh, where are the largest expenses? And what your margins are? You're making money. You know, you won't know until you run the numbers and you do it on a regular basis. I do mine on a regular basis, monthly, well, with my assistant. Uh, I mean, that could be a topic for another discussion. We do a cash flow, uh, you know, it's a performance. Uh, we call it scoring, S-C-O-R-I-N-G. Uh, we have a, me a monthly meeting, uh, you know, with my assistant where we go through the numbers uh, in terms of uh, my portfolio to gauge how we're doing. I do that every month. And uh, one of my goals this month is to enhance that even further, um, you know, because uh, you got to understand how your business is doing and therefore you can make proactive decisions, uh, whether they're good, bad or ugly. But at least, you know, if you are underperforming in certain areas, if you've got negative cash flow in certain areas, if your expenses are high in certain areas, you can take proactive, um, you know, action rather than not knowing. And then, you know, you get hit by a curveball and next thing you know, you know, you're out. Uh, another act is to develop a tenant retention strategy. 
uh, you know, I'm all into that one. You want to make sure that uh, your tenants stay a long time and they don't just stay by accident. You've got to have a strategy. Uh, you know, my strategy, we can talk about that another time. So develop a tenant retention plan. Uh, happy long-term tenants, you know, stabilize, provide stable stability to your cash flow. And uh, you may want to consider incentives uh, for them to renew, to stay a long time. That's part of your strategy. Uh, proactive maintenance. Uh, I think it's useful to uh, invest in proactive maintenance and, uh, you know, do things that hopefully will, um, you know, will protect your investment. Also, uh, uh, develop a strategic uh, or an emergency fund. Have some money in reserves uh, specifically for your real estate because you may get hit by certain unforeseen expenses and uh, or unforeseen vacancy. Um, you know, so you want that safety net during those lean periods uh, to allow you to survive during that time. OK, and then we move on to uh, step three. But anyway, before I get to step three, uh, if you've got some questions, please put them in the uh, question box, chat box. I will get to them very shortly. If you'd like, uh, if you think today's session is a good one, please give me some thumbs up and share with your friends. Tell your friends about the Wealth Wednesdays. And my goal is to provide you with quality content, not fluff, but content that you can use and content that is, uh, I think, trending. Uh, content that's valuable and hopefully content that will help you on your journey towards financial independence. So if you've got some questions, put them in the chat box and I'll get to them shortly. And then number three is when do you sell? Uh, you know, uh, you know, obviously, you know, the key question I think as, it, as this pertains to is how can I capitalize on market peace and to optimize my profits. So when should I sell? Obviously, in an ideal world, you'll sell when the market's top, when it's hit the peak, and that way you'll maximize your return. But you know, we don't. It's not always possible to do that. Uh, you can't time the market. Sometimes, uh, sometimes, like in my case, I have a tenant just left. Uh, you know, uh, it, it is what it is. It. it I I'd rather, you know, not kick my tenants out. I just wait until they decide to leave. And then I'll make that decision whether to sell it or to keep it and so on. So anyway, so how do you capitalize on market peaks, peaks uh, so that you can maximize your uh, profits? That's the question. So selling properties in the market, at the top of the market is obviously the ideal uh, scenario. And, um, you know, that way you make the most profits. You don't obviously don't want to sell it during the troughs, the lowest, you know, the, the dips in the market. Um, you know, you don't want to do that if you can avoid that unless you really, really have to. So it really, it, it, you know, deciding when to sell involves lots of different things. It obviously, it involves knowing what the current property value is, uh, understanding market trends in your particular area. You've got to understand demand patterns that's going on. And also, you've got to have an understanding of the econo e economic uh, forecast for your area, for your property, for your, um, you know, for your zip code, for your neighborhood, for your city. Um, you know, obviously, there's a, a tax implications of selling. Uh, you know, if it's appreciated a lot, you got some capital gain you're going to have to, um, uh, you know, uh, be aware of. And uh, that could dip into your potential profits. Uh, and uh, also, if you're a new investor, especially if you're on your growth uh, stage where you're trying to build this portfolio, uh, there, there are, there's value to selling one property and use the proceeds to then buy mul multiple properties. So you kind of reallocate your funds, look at your uh, uh, portfolio, find out which properties are performing the best, keep those, the ones which are not performing, sell those, and then you can use those funds to buy better performing assets. So you can divide, divest from properties once they've met their purpose, uh, especially if they're not performing well, and you can then reinvest in other properties in, or in other areas where you have much better rates of growth and potential. So let's do a case study. Uh, in this case study, we have Marie. So Marie is a seasoned investor and she clo closely monitors the property's value, uh, trying to figure out when's the peak of the market, okay? She's recognized that uh, we're kind of hitting towards the, the peak of the market. And, uh, and so there's a lot of demand in her area. And so she's trying to exit. 
Okay, so she's going to exit the market, take the money and run, or reinvest that money into purchase more properties, uh, more single families, more uh, maybe multifamily or commercial. But the idea is that she's using one asset uh, to then purchase more assets, and uh, which is essentially what I did. Uh, but my slide was different. I bought a house. I then got a home equity line of credit. Uh, so I didn't sell the house. I took a loan to, you know, to capture some of the equity in there and then use that home equity line uh, to buy more houses. So I kept the, the, the main asset and you leverage that asset to acquire more assets. So what are some of the action items uh, in a situation like this? Um, let's have a look. So uh, monitor local markets, you know, to when to sell, you know, look at certain indicators. Uh, look at trends, analyze property values, look at demand patterns, uh, keep an eye on the market in terms of, all right, are prices rising? Are they stabilized? Uh, look at things like uh, days on market on the MLS. Uh, look at the uh, market in terms of, is there a demand increasing or decreasing? Uh, look at your, evaluate your portfolio. That's an action item you can do. Uh, identify what I call underperforming assets or properties and consider selling some of those. Um, you know, if it makes sense. Uh, also, there are tax implications. So obviously, you want to make sure that uh, you understand uh, the tax implications of selling your property. You may want to speak to a, uh, a tax expert who can advise you on that one and uh, and so on. So with that said, my friends, it's 7.33. I'm going to wrap it up uh, with a little conclusion. Mastering the cycles for long-term mm -hmm. prosperity. Uh, so really, you know, mastering this is, uh, it's almost like a, uh, intricate dance, uh, you know, uh, in terms of when to buy, when to sell, what to hold. Uh, but understanding that is really the cornerstone of your financial success as a real estate investor. Uh, the ability to discern when's the, the best time to buy, uh, hold or sell, you know, it really sets, I would say, investors apart. Some investors have got it down pat and uh, they're able to ride these markets and not lose any money. In fact, they 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 uh, uh, they flourish uh, during market cycles because they you know they know when to buy, when to hold, and when to sell. So navigating those dynamics is really going to be key for you for your success. And uh, you know, but to do it properly, you got to empower yourself with knowledge. Uh, you got to embrace uh, opportunities. And, uh, you know, you're going to have to take action. You're going to have to embark on your real estate journey yourself. You can't uh, listen to podcasts all day. You can't listen to live streams forever. At some point, you've got to pull the, pull the trigger and take some action. So what are some of the action items that uh, you may want to consider? Uh, in conclusion, is continuous learning. Uh, commit to continuous education. Uh, stay abreast of market trends, investment strategies, economic indicators. Listen to bot books, podcasts, live streams, attend webinars, and so on. Uh, look at your, review your portfolio on a regular basis. Uh, I, I do mine once a month. Um, you know, you may want to do yours every quarter or whatever it is, but review your portfolio and see how it's performing. And, uh, you know, if it's doing well, fine. If it's not, then, you know, consider uh, alternatives. And then networking and mentorship. There are people out here who are very seasoned, are very experienced that you may want to tap into there um their experiences and so hopefully you can avoid making what i call unnecessary unnecessary mistakes so seek mentors seek coaches seek seasoned investors uh who are more experienced than you learning from other experience other people's experience really it, it really helps you um you know because uh it's, it's just a smart way to go and so incorporating these insights into your overall plan, I think you'll be fine. So the idea is this, when to buy, when to sell, when to hold. That's what we talked about today. Uh, there is no right time, but with knowledge, information, guidance, I think you'll be doing fine. Fine. So with that said, my friends, I'm going to wrap it up and I'm going to go to Q&A. So again, put your questions in the chat box and I will get to them uh, as soon as I can. And if you want to reach out to me, as usual, you can always reach me at joe at joeasimo.com on email. I'll do the best I can to return your emails. Uh, and with that said and done, my friend, let's get down to the comments. And hopefully I will do the Q&A. So we're going to go to Ask Dr. Joe Q&A now. 
So put your questions in and I'll try to help and answer as much as I can. So let's have a look what we've got today. We've got James. James Sandman, how are you? I'm doing fine. How are you, sir? Hope you're doing well. Dr. Joe, hopefully as well. Was looking forward for this. Well, I'm glad that you're on. And uh, as usual, Karim, I hope you're having a great day wherever you are. Uh, Dow2, hey, from Phoenix. Hey, Dow2. A regular. So I hope you're doing well, Dow2, in sunny Phoenix. And also B. Francis in South Jersey. Okay. So at Francis, Karim, where in South Jersey are you? Uh, I don't know. Where in... Uh, let's have a look. Maybe he's going to answer this question now. Uh, I, Dr. Joe, I'm excited about Section 8 rental, but no surrounding properties are below 600K. Okay. What well, things or metrics to consider for out-of-state Section 8 rental? Can you get a property manager to manage Section 8 rentals? Okay. Let me hit these things. Uh, he, okay. So Karim's excited about Section 8 rentals, uh, but where he is, um, you know, it's in, uh, you know, I'm assuming it's South Jersey or wherever you are, Karim, it's expensive. It sounds like you, it's difficult to find stuff below 600 K. Uh, what metrics to consider for out of state section eight? Well, I don't know. I think you, you may be able to find some, uh, properties. I mean, where I live is very expensive as well in the DC area. Uh, it's probably the same as same here. So what I do um, you know, I look for properties where I can force appreciation. So I buy houses that are in bad condition and therefore I can get a little cheaper. Okay. I can, uh, you know, uh, do some improvements and the way section eight works is all about the number of bedrooms. So I, I strategically add bedrooms to get more rent. And therefore, although I'm paying a lot in this area, I'm able to cash flow because, uh, the rents that I get, uh, is based on the number of bedrooms in the house. So as I add more bedrooms, I get more rent for the same asset. So that's how I strategically I'm able to cash flow in crazy markets like we have here in the Washington, D.C. area. So uh, I'm sure it's really possible to do the same kind or similar kind of thing where you are. Um, it shouldn't be necessary to go, you know, the other side of the country or many, many miles, hundreds of thousands of miles away. No. Most of the times, all you got to do is 45 minutes to an hour drive from where you are. You're almost in a different market. So if it may not work where you are, it may work 30, 40 minutes, 45 minutes, 60 minutes from where you are. And uh, and you don't have to travel the other side of the country. There's a story. What's it? Uh, what was that story? Uh, the guy who I forgot what it was now. Is it? Uh, it's ancient. This is a fable. Uh, where the guy, uh, you know, uh, you know, many years ago, he wanted to seek riches. So he's looking for acres of diamonds. That's it. Acres of diamonds. He's seeking uh, riches uh, outside, you know, many, many hundreds of miles, thousand miles away. So he left where he was, go looking for these, you know, looking for riches. Uh, either the grass is green on the other side. So he was searching, searching, searching. And then he came back penniless. And somebody eventually bought his original land where he was and found, uh, you know, diamonds there. So uh, the moral of the story is that you don't always have to go far away. Uh, there are acres of diamonds where you are. Uh, you know, somebody somewhere is making money where you and where you want to invest. So the easiest way is to go find those kind of people and understand what are they doing. And hopefully you can uh, learn from them. Uh, can you get a property manager to manage your Section 8 properties? Yes, certainly. There are management companies. Um, you know, there, you know, there are some management companies that that's what they do. They specialize in Section 8. So they have the experience uh, because Section 8 tenants uh, are, are different. And, uh, you know, your ability to understand uh, the dynamics there is very, very important. Some property management companies are just not used to uh working with prop uh section eight tenants so it, it's it's they're out there and uh you know it's your job to find them screen them and then hopefully you can manage the management company uh and so on so good question uh karim your pref you prefer a single family or can i do multi-family on section eight if there's an issue in your property how do you recommend i can handle if i'm out of state 
and the GC is expensive for me. Okay. Uh, I do single families. That's what I do. I'm not saying, I mean, there are plenty of landlords out here who do multifamily on Section 8. So it's definitely, it can be done. Um, it's just that uh, I just decided my niche is single families uh, because, uh, you know, families tend to at least three, four, five, six bedroom voucher holders. They, they prefer a house more so than an apartment. And since I'm all about minimizing turnover, uh, I want them to, um, you know, once they come to my house, stay forever. And you're more likely to get that in a house more so than an apartment. It's my experience anyway. So if there's an issue uh, in your property, how do you recommend I handle it if I'm out of state? Well, then if you're going to be reliant on the management company. So I'm assuming you're going to pick a management company. Uh, management company is going to manage the property for you. If you're rehabbing it uh, and you're rehabbing a house that's out of state, and if you don't have a local presence, uh, that's that could be a problem because, uh, you know, things happen during the renovation. And uh, if you're not there to to look out for your interests, then, you know, some people can take advantage of that. I'm not saying they would, but I'm just saying that some people have hidden agendas. So if the GC is expensive for you, then I would say that you want to get somebody local who's looking out for your interests and, uh, and at least can be your eyes and ears on a local level if you're not able to go there. Uh, and so that's why I buy properties within 30 minutes, 45 minutes or an hour of my house. That way I can, you know, check it out and be available and things like that. I mean, it's, it's unfortunate, but the, the most per the person who's going to be most concerned about your property is you. Uh, you can't expect somebody else to be as concerned about your property uh you know as, as as they are their properties i mean you know it's it, it is what it is so uh if you're not concerned about it then you better make sure you got some good people who don't have hidden agendas and trying to you know take advantage of your situation uh karim is in atlantic county in new jersey i suppose i'm not sure where atlantic county is i assume it's in south jersey i think or at least in that vicinity uh, Dow two in the previous stream you mentioned that your tenant goes to month to month after one year after year one. I have a non non housing lease that I had my housing tenant sign to because this is in a HOA. I have a known non housing lease. I'm not sure what that is. Okay, so uh, typically um, for Section Eight. You have a 12-month lease. They have what we call a HAP contract, Housing Assistance Program contract, which is usually one year. And then thereafter that, at least around here, it goes to month to month. Uh, so that's how it goes. And so I've had my longest tenants 26 years. Technically, it's a month to month uh, for the last 25 years. And uh, so we don't need to sign a lease. Uh, it just reverts to a month to month thereafter. Okay. That, that's how it works here anyway. We don't have to, you know, renew the lease. It automatically reverts to uh, a month to month uh, on the HAP contract. Um, so I'm not too sure. He says, I'm not, I don't follow that. You may have to come back down to, I have a non housing lease. Okay. So I assume that you don't have a, a, a section eight lease. There's no such thing as a section eight lease. It's just whatever lease that you have. And then they have a, a HAP contract, which uh, supersedes that. That's between you and the housing authority. Uh, and uh, so you sounds like you had another lease with the tenant signed uh, because you're in a HOA. So yeah, typically you, you have a lease between yourself and the tenant. And, uh, and so... Uh, and so that's how that works. Okay. Sweet tea. What's your tenant retention strategy? Tenant retention strategy is all about trying to keep my tenants to stay. Uh, so I survey my tenants on a regular basis to make sure that they're happy, make sure there's no issues. I stay in contact with my tenants every now and then, checking with them. Um, you know, I do things like uh, bouquets of flowers. 
for Mother's Day, Christmas presents, um, you know, free vacations. I mean, there's a lot of stuff I do to differentiate myself from uh, my competition. I want them to know that uh, I'm a good guy. I'm a regular guy. I'm not, you know, Mr. Big Shot Money. I'm just a regular Joe. And uh, I can talk just as well with a, a CEO as I can with my voucher holder tenants. Uh, I don't look down on them. Um, they're just regular people. They've got the same challenges. Uh, their situation may be uh, more severe than me, but uh, society generally looks down on vouchers. Uh, society tends to look down on voucher holders. And, uh, and so they have a tough life. And so I don't look down on them. I see them as uh, just good people. I mean, I have good tenants. I have tier one tenants. So I'm trying to, so I spend a lot of time making sure I get the right people. And once, I, once they're in my houses, I tend to do what I can to try to keep them to stay uh, and so on. So hopefully that was helpful. Get lobby Easter. It seems like most of the properties for use for Section 8 have four plus rooms. If so, is that part of your strategy? If so, why? How our housing authority says they rarely give out vouchers beyond three bedrooms. Well, I don't know where you are, uh, Get Lobster, uh, but I know that where we are uh, in the Washington, D.C. area, uh, there's a lot of people with three, four, five, six bedroom vouchers. Obviously, the higher the voucher size, the fewer the numbers. So there are more three bedroom voucher holders than there are four. There are more four bedrooms than they are five. There are more five bedrooms than six and so forth. So it's almost like a bell curve. And uh, so, but the problem is the fact that it's hard to cash flow in this market because it's so, so expensive with three bedrooms. You know, the rents that they, they pay uh, versus the debt that you have to incur, it's just, it's hard. So I like the, that's the reason why I go for four, five, and sixes. Now that there's plenty of four, five, and six bedroom voucher holders in this area. Now, I don't know about where you are. Again, it's, it, you're going to have to play it by each area is different. And so what you want to do is to contact your local housing authority and find out from them which voucher size has the greatest problem finding houses, uh, which group takes a long time for them to find houses, uh, which means that there's a demand, but there's not enough supply. So you may want to consider that one. Uh, but where you are, it sounds like they saying that there aren't, they don't give many vouchers above three. Um, well, I mean, that's where you are. It's not where I am. I don't, we don't have that uh, problem here. Uh, we have, the problem is that the people with four, five and sixes, there's just not a whole lot of supply. And uh, and so those people have a very difficult time, especially five and sixes, finding anything. They're just hard to find five and six bedroom houses in D.C. Um, okay, Ty. Uh, uh, with interest rates high, house prices are historically high, and affordability virtually non-existent. Do you think the market will continue to appreciate in the next three to five years? Uh, yes. Uh, I mean, it is what it is. Uh, you know, I mean, 10 years ago, I thought, I mean, surely no one's going to pay any more than this. Um, so it depends where you are, obviously. It's very local specific. Uh, where I am in the D.C. area, um, it's the nation's capital. The economy is very strong historically. Um, you know, there's a lot of, it's a good employment center. And a lot of jobs, people move into this area. Land is very restricted. So um, prices, there's never been a seven-year period ever, ever, uh, at least as far as I know, with uh, going back with uh, Federal Reserve data, there's never been a seven-year period of time where prices have gone down in the D.C. So uh, I don't envision that prices will go down anytime soon. It's just the way it is. People will figure it out. And, uh, you know, five, 10 years from now, I'm pretty sure you're going to be saying, my goodness, if only I bought in 2023 when it was cheap. Um, that's just the way it plays out, you know. Now, I don't know where you are, Ty. You know, it may be different in your market, but I could certainly, 
historically, uh, that's how it's played out in this market here in the DC area. So, you know, the issue is, you know, is how do you position yourself such that you can buy? That's the challenge. How do you, how do you position yourself such that you can buy in this crazy market? That is the challenge. And so you're going to need to figure out how to buy. And the problem here is that it's so expensive. The only way I can buy a house uh, is to buy properties where I don't have a lot of competition. And uh, if the house is in great condition, every homeowner wants that house. So there's a lot of demand, a lot of competition. So I tend to buy houses that are in disrepair, that don't look good, that are too intimidating for homeowners. So I get tend to not have to worry about those people. And uh, but everybody has to have their own strategy as to your acquisition, what you buy, where you buy. It. But uh, we don't know what's going to happen in the next three to five years. I don't know. Uh, but all I do know is that over the next five to 10, 15, 20 years, uh, I don't know, but I'm pretty sure that uh, I, I'll be regretting if I didn't buy today. Now to my non-housing tenants signing new lease. Okay, so non-housing tenants means that they, they are tenants. They don't have a, a voucher, I'm assuming. They're just market renters. Uh, sign a new lease after one year. My question is, is, even if your housing tenants goes month to month after one year, do you have your housing tenants sign a new non-housing lease? No. After, I mean, the way my lease is written, it, it automatically reverts to a month to month after the end of the first year. So, uh, you know, I don't have to sign a new lease again. Now, if there's an adjustment in rent, you may sign an addendum uh, to the lease, uh, but you don't have to sign a brand new lease because my lease goes month to month. Uh, so if there's any changes, then you can sign an addendum, uh, a one page or two page or whatever that just spells out the change. So if there's an increase in rent uh, or if there's a change in the terms, then you have an addendum, and the the addendum references the references the main lease that you signed originally. Uh, hopefully that answered your question, though. To doubt to. Uh, so no, I don't. I don't. I mean, the, my tenant who's been with me for twenty six years, she's still on the same lease. My tenants who have been there twenty years are still on the same lease. Okay, so I don't sign a new lease, uh, and I regularly have. 5, 10, 15, 20 year tenant regularly, consistently. I think I'm averaging seven years per tenant. Uh, so I don't have a new lease every year for every tenant. No, no, no. I, I just, uh, it just reverts to month to month. And if there's a rent increase, then, uh, you know, that gets approved uh, by the housing authority and you send the tenants notice uh, and so on. So thanks, that too. Oh, sorry about that. Okay, I've got some, a lot of questions today. Uh, Amalfi, uh, if you have an open HELOC, but you don't own anything, can you get another HELOC from another bank that gives you more money than the first one? If yes, do I need to cancel the first HELOC? Let me read that again. If you have an open HELOC, so you got a, you got a property, you got a HELOC on the house, you got a home equity line of credit, but you don't own anything. Own it. I, I assume you mean owe anything, uh, which means that you're not using the HELOC. Can you get another HELOC from another bank that gives you more money? So you want to have two HELOCs, I think. Uh, you can't have a heal two HELOCs, I don't think, because in order to get the the new HELOC, they're going to do a title search, uh, and the title search is going to uncover your original HELOC. There's a lien on your house. Uh, unless it's not recorded. If it, now, if it's not recorded, then they'll no, no one will know. But if it's recorded at a courthouse, which most lenders will probably do, uh, then it's on public record that there's a HELOC for your house. So the second HELOC company is going to either want you to close it out, uh, cancel it, because otherwise they're going to be in a third position. Okay, So the first is going to be whatever the main mortgage is, the first HELOC is going to be in second position. And if you go for another HELOC, they're going to be in third position, which means that if something happens, 
they're going to have to be uh, behind the first and second. So their exposure is greater. So most companies don't want to be in third position. So they're going to probably require that you pay off uh, or close out the uh, the second or the first HELOC uh, or the second lien on the house. That's been my experience. Uh, Michelle. Hey, Michelle. How are you? Uh, big thanks. Great session. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, hope you're doing well. I think you're in London now. So uh, hope it's all well in London. And uh, hope I'll see you next time you're back in the U.S. Hey, Johnny. How you doing, man? Uh, hope you're doing well, Johnny. Hope the property is doing well for you. Chris, the software guy. Hey, Dr. Joe. I'm just dropping in to listen to these gems. Oh, you're welcome. I uh, hope this is good for you, Chris, the software guy. And Karim, let's have a look what Karim said. When you try to force appreciation, what type of equity do you look for? So let's say a property is 800K appreciation. Would would you buy it for 650 if it needs, and it needs work? Section 8 on multiple, section 8 on multifamily. Can it work? Okay, so let's see if I can break this down from Korea. Uh, when you try to force appreciation, what type of equity do you look for? Uh, obviously, you know, when I do the refi, the, uh, the mortgage company is going to do a 75 to 80% loan to value. Okay. So let's take, so I buy a house for 60,000. I put 20,000 in it. So I'm in it for 80. And then I refinance it, okay, uh, with a new loan at 80% loan to value, which means that the new loan will be 80000 which hopefully will pay off, uh, you know, the original acquisition and the renovation and replace that with, uh, you know, a new loan. So in that scenario, the 20000 which I'm spending on the renovation is – you know, I'm using that money to force appreciation. I'm buying a house for 60, put 20 in it, and that 20 forces it to be 40, okay? So it's a two-to-one relationship. For every dollar I spend, I'm getting $2 worth of appreciation. I put in 20000 and I got 40000 in terms of appreciation. Hopefully that makes sense. So uh, so it's so it's not you – def, you definitely don't want a one-to-one relationship. You want a one-to – one to 1.5, one point one to two, a relationship in terms of dollar that you spend and appreciation that that gr- creates. Uh, so you can kind of do the math from there. So if you buy a property, you want to make sure that uh, you know if you're going to rehab it, that uh, after the rehab is done, the house is worth a lot more than what you spent. In other words, you don't want to buy a house for. 50, 60,000, put 20 in it. Uh, so now you're in it for 80,000 and the house is worth 80. Okay. So you put 20 in, but you got 20 out. So, so there was no equity from, it was a one-to-one relationship. So you want to one to two, one to 1.5 and things like, I hope that makes sense. Uh, I'm trying to break it down as much as possible. Single family. So section eight or a multi, I'm not sure what that is. Can it work? I mean, it can work. Uh, I mean, I do it all the time. Uh, multifamily, I'm not really, I don't do a whole lot of multifamily. So, um, but yeah, I mean, it's the same concept. You spend, you renovate and improve a house or a, a building uh, with the goal that you're forcing appreciation. You're forcing the value greater than what you're putting in. Uh, so it was, oh, it's eight o'clock already. Oh my goodness. I got to wrap it up. What are your general thoughts on DSCR for single families? Yeah, debt, debt, debt service coverage ratio loans. Uh, I have I've had views them in the past. Uh, typically, they're for commercial uh, loans. So if you have uh, properties that are in LLCs or entities, typically you have to when you do the refi. Uh, many times you do what we call a DSCR loan, as opposed to the residential loan, and where the lender bases the amount they borrow based on two things. One is uh, you know, the cash flow, well, can, you know, can, can the rent be covered by the debt? 
And if so, what's the ratio? Uh, also, they look into the overall debt on that property as well. So um, it's a bit more complicated than that. Uh, but yeah, I do DSEO. I've used them before. Uh, software guy, Chris. Hey, Dr. Joe, I'm just here to listen to this amazing information. I can't wait to attend another workshop for yours. Uh, this is Chris. Oh, yeah, I remember Chris. Hey, Chris, how you doing, man? Hope you're doing well. Yeah, look forward to seeing you. Yeah, we had a great session last time. Uh, look forward to seeing you in the next session. Next session we do, um, you know, I'll let everybody know. You really should come. It's a great chance to get some real great information. I'll probably do another session sometime in January. Uh, sorry, December with Femi's Property here in Washington, D.C. as a student of mine. Uh, get lobster. What criteria do you use when deciding what realtors to use? What questions should I be asking potential realtors to determine if they'll support my investment goals? I definitely would ask, try to get them to know, do they work with investors? Because a lot of realtors, uh, they think you're crazy trying to buy a hundred thousand dollar house for 80. They, they think it, it's impossible. Uh, you know, um, so there are some agents who who work with investors they understand what investors are looking for and they're able to um work with investors and uh, so i would definitely try to ask them uh or you can go to ria meetings uh real estate investment association meetings and then you can sort of speak to people there uh, and find out what relatives that they use and many times at ria meetings uh, a lot of investors a lot of realtors go there so you can sort of uh, network with people when you at these events. Uh, okay, I'm gonna wrap it up now. Uh, so Amalfi, thanks. That's my that answers my question. Okay, good. Well, my friends, it is now uh, eight oh three. I think I'll wrap it up for the day. Uh, again, hopefully today was helpful. I had a good time, and uh, we'll have another great session next week. Again, if you want to shoot me an email, you can reach me at joe at joeasimo.com. Joe at joeasimo.com. If you want to engage with me, uh, I will be doing uh, one hours, uh, one on one. So if you want to book a time with me, uh, let me know and then we'll uh, see what we can do there. Shoot me an email. Uh, I will be for, for select people who want to sort of, you know, do one on ones with me. Uh, I'm going to allow that to happen. So it's, but you have to book it and, uh, and so on. So anyway, with that said, my friends, I'm going to wrap it up for the day. Hope you had a good one and I'll see you. This time next Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern time. Take care. Have a great day. Bye for now.